path we have chosen for the present is full of hazards, as all paths are. But it is the one most consistent with our character and courage as a nation and our commitments around the world. The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere. And we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. November 11, 1963, Veterans Day. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy and his son John Jr. visited the tomb of the unknown soldier. Two weeks later, Sergeant Keith Clark would once again play taps for the president, who would take his place among the heroes at Arlington National Cemetery. The Thousand Days, President Kennedy's thousand days in office brought a new style to the White House and a new image to Washington. Jacqueline Kennedy, with her taste for beauty and refinement, created a mood of simple splendor at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Elegance, youth, warmth emanated from the decorous presidential mansion. Culture and history filled the ballrooms as music, art, and theater created a mood of elevated entertainment at White House dinners and receptions. The president and the first lady cultivated finesse and charm as they honored dignitaries, intellectuals, and artists from all over the world. Jackie redecorated the White House with period pieces that reflected the history and the traditions of many presidencies. For the first time since Theodore Roosevelt was president, children lived in the White House. The first family caught the public imagination as the presidency came to be associated with more than politics and diplomacy. Indeed, the image of the country was changing. People all over the world flocked to see the American they adored and his wife whom they adored even more. How long had it been since a United States president had received such welcomes abroad? Shriver was dedicated to this project, but he first had to answer the charges of nepotism. You know, I don't know anything about any Peace Corps. And he said, well, that's all right, neither does anybody else. And I said, but yes, but remember all the political debts you incurred during the campaign. Why don't you give this uh, job to one of your political friends? <clears throat> he said, listen, Sarge, the truth of the matter is that everybody thinks the Peace Corps is going to be one of the greatest fiascos in history. It turns out that way, it's much easier to fire a relative than a political friend. <laughs> this is a voluntary effort. Most of you, I understand... The first a, group of volunteers uh, set off for Africa. You spend uh, your time in a good many uh, countries living under conditions of hardship. All of you go to a continent about which we know very little. So I want you to know that in going to Africa, you represent the best of our country. And uh, I know they will welcome you. And I think that uh, you will have the feeling of having served this country uh, uh, and, in a broader sense, the free community of people uh, in a very crucial time. It's very easy to make speeches about what uh, ought to be done about this country and how it can be improved. I hear them all the time. But you, at least, are picking up your bags and going someplace and doing something. And that's why we're glad to have you. Doing something was the theme of the new Kennedy administration and the Peace Corps its most eloquent proponent. In Latin America, too, the hijos de Kennedy, children of Kennedy, were welcomed with open arms. Latin America was at a turning point when President Kennedy and the First Lady arrived in Venezuela in 1961. Kennedy proposed that North and South America join together in an alliance for progress. The United States would seek to support democracy, to aid in programs of land reform and economic stabilization, 
and to stimulate exchange and cooperation between the two continents. One of the uh, Kennedys uh, does not need an interpreter, so I'd like to have my wife uh, say just a word uh, to you. Both abroad and at home, people everywhere could not get their fill of the Kennedy children. John Jr. may have been more of a Bouvier than a Kennedy when it came to rough sports. Caroline tried to take after her mother's artistic temperament, not always with success. A priority for Jack and Jackie was budgeting time to be with their children. If you bungle raising your children, Jackie said, I don't think whatever else you do well matters very much. Ninety miles off the coast of Florida lay Cuba, an island governed by the communist leader Fidel Castro. In 1960, President Eisenhower entrusted the CIA to plan an overthrow of Castro's regime. Cuba would be invaded by CIA-trained and armed Cuban exiles. The U.S. would provide covert air support. The CIA plan for the secret invasion was disclosed to Kennedy after his election. He was briefed by Eisenhower the day before his inauguration. Eisenhower reminded Kennedy that it was the new administration's responsibility to do whatever necessary to make the Cuban invasion successful. General Maxwell Taylor later surmised that Kennedy must have felt that if the plan were approved by General Eisenhower, the greatest military man in America, it must have been militarily sound. Kennedy was soon to discover the contrary. Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara and Secretary of State Dean Rusk were among the Joint Chiefs of Staff and White House advisors, the brightest and the best, who attended a crucial meeting on April 4, 1961. As the invasion was a CIA operation, the Pentagon did not perform a complete military study. Misinformed by the CIA and poorly briefed by his advisors, Kennedy was about to learn a harsh lesson. Kennedy's cabinet and advisors agreed to the mission, although Senator William Fulbright, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, had characterized the invasion as immoral and illegal. The son of Joseph Kennedy, bred to be tough and courageous, feared seeming soft. Yet he would not publicly commit his administration to the illegal invasion, even though he admired the direct, decisive style of the CIA. On April 12th, Kennedy spoke to reporters. Well, first, I want to say that there will not be under any condition be an intervention in Cuba by United States Armed Forces. This government will do everything it possibly can, and I think it can meet its responsibilities to make sure that there are no Americans involved in any action inside Cuba. 1,500 Cuban exiles were trained by the CIA. But when they landed on Cuba, they were attacked by Castro's Air Force. The Cuban leader personally directed the defense of the Bay of Pigs. The invaders looked toward the U.S. for backup. 
Kennedy secretly agreed to send in six unmarked Navy jets, but the air support was insufficient. Castro's forces soon contained the attack, pushing the insurgents into the sea and strafing the beaches. More than a thousand Cuban invaders were taken prisoner. They were eventually released in exchange for $50 million in supplies and $3 million in cash. Kennedy realized too late that mismanagement, hesitation, and fundamental errors in moral judgment resulted in the greatest fiasco of his presidency. The CIA would continue to plot Castro's assassination throughout Kennedy's administration, going so far as to hire mafia help. Kennedy was left alone to decide how to deal with his first failure. He hadn't questioned the basic morality of the invasion. Instead, he had worried more about concealing the U.S. involvement. He finally chose to be gallantly honest. I bear the responsibility of the presidency of the United States. And it is my duty to make decisions that no advisor and no ally can make for me. It is my obligation and responsibility to see that these decisions are as informed as possible, that they are based on as much direct, first-hand knowledge as possible. The days of work and worry in the White House were balanced with moments of recreation. The Kennedys enjoyed sailing with friends on their yacht, the Honey Fitz, named after Jack's grandfather. While Kennedy was growing swiftly into his responsibilities as Commander-in-Chief, his son John Jr. was trying to learn from his father's mistakes. When steering in dangerous waters, keep your eyes open. Surrounded by family and friends, though never far from the problems and decisions he faced as president, Kennedy was perhaps happiest in the free, open breeze of the sea. The children were playful, unafraid of the sea. And if they could not attract the attention of the dutiful captain concentrated on the safety of his illustrious passengers, they were sure to have moments of frolic and affection with their father. During his 1961 trip to France, Kennedy had no illusions about resolving differences with French President Charles de Gaulle, but he was intent on developing a rapport with the man he admired so much. General de Gaulle, the proud leader of the Free French during World War II, agreed completely with Kennedy on defending West Berlin. But on the matter of defense and the NATO alliance, their views diverged. Though much was not resolved, the Paris talks did highlight the respect that had brought together an impatient, energetic new frontiersman and an aging European traditionalist. But the trip did bring a sensation sweeping through Paris. The city buzzed with excitement at Jacqueline Kennedy's every appearance. The Kennedys were honored at a dinner and ballet performance at the very...